Before we begin, um, well, I want to welcome all of you. I am really, really happy each of you is here. This is my first time teaching in person after four years. And yes! And the last time I taught in person, it was here at the SF Dharma Collective. So it just feels like full circle. I'm very, very happy to have you all here. And I want to say that I deeply respect each and every one of you and your needs, your energy. So, and the fact that you are adults, welcome. And take care of your needs. If you need to stand up, stand up. If you need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. I used to be an elementary school teacher in my previous incarnation, like 30 years ago. And, um, one of the things that deeply troubled me was that children always had to ask for permission to take care of their body and sometimes that would be denied and teachers would be like no not until we finish this and um so please go to the bathroom there's tea and water there so feel free to nourish yourself if you need to take a moment go out take fresh air you can also go out that way take fresh air there's a little beautiful patio uh, for people who are on Zoom. If you want to stretch, if you want to stand up, if you want to lie down, please take care of yourselves. You know your energy, you know your bodies. So just honor yourselves, okay? All right, so Noam, what do you think? Shall we start or? Okay, great. So good to see you, Abby, in the East Coast. <laughs> um, Welcome everyone again. My name is Alejandra Siroca and I am a transformative communication teacher and coach. I am the founder of Language Alchemy, which is what we're going to be exploring once a month and um, in, in different ways. And I want to say that Language Alchemy is not something I created. It is something that rests on the hearts, the shoulders, the minds of so many beautiful people who have devoted their lives to consciousness, to awareness, to communication, and beautiful traditions, Western traditions that come from Asia, from India, from Tibet, from Latin America. And so what I am going to be exploring with all of you here is an integration of my experiences and my studies of that, including studying linguistics, social linguistics, psycholinguistics, and Buddhist psychology. So many times you're going to hear that what we explore here is maybe something, a question or something you've explored before. I want to invite you to consider that you are not the same person you were a week ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. So bring an open heart. Bring eyes and ears to explore something from a different perspective. There's a saying, we don't step into the same river twice if we're conscious, if we're aware. So this is an invitation. Language talking is also three things. <clears throat> it is an awareness practice. So the first thing we're going to do throughout these workshops is to bring more awareness as to how we're showing up in the world, how we are communicating, not just with each other, but how we are communicating with ourselves. What's happening internally with our internal communication system, which is something that we're going to talk about a lot. And it is also a communication approach that again is a confluence of many communication approach, approaches, including inside dialogue, nonviolent communication, neuro-linguistic programming, and um, other tantric approaches from Tibet and India and Shaiva Tantra. And it is also a form of evolutionary activism. It's a way in which we look at how do we evolve? What kind of world, what kind of people do uh, we need in this world so that we can have more compassion, more equity, more equality, more love? that I believe is possible, not just in for future generations, but right now, today, as we explore together during these two hours, 
as well as when we go outside and we meet our fellow humans. <gasps> Tamara, oh my goodness, hello. So happy to see you. She just came back from Colombia. Come on in, welcome, welcome. Okay. Yes, go to the bathroom. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we're gonna wait for Tamara to go to the bathroom and come back. And then I want to say that we are going to start with a meditation. I consider meditation, sometimes I call it meditation, sometimes I call it self-connection, because meditation is a beautiful way of connecting to ourselves, of dropping in and listening deeply to the language that's inside, in our energy bodies, in our subtle bodies, in our emotional bodies, in our intellectual bodies, in our physical bodies. So as we're waiting for her to come back, how about you um, start if you need to stretch? So honor your body, listen right now, what do you need? Do you need to stretch? Do you need to be in a position uh, that would support your meditation practice? We know that having access to a spine that is, elong is as elongated as possible, whether you wanna lie down here, or there are also um, saffos that you can bring and sit on the, on the floor if that would be more supportive to you. Do you need something to support your back? Do you need a blanket? What do you need? Yeah, so just, hello, Anya, come on in, welcome. So let's just take a moment to notice what it's like to be here in this beautiful place. This grassroot volunteer community in the ancestral land of the Remetush Ohlone people. Notice what it's like to be here in a place that has been devoted to the liberation of all, the liberation of suffering the bringing forth of peace, love, connection, awareness. Notice what it's like to be in an intentional space. And now intentionally be in your body. What is it like to be in your body right now? Notice your body. Listen to your body. Do you need any adjustments of your posture? Honor your body. And now notice your breath in your body. Receive the inhale. Receive the exhale. Feel the inhale. Feel the exhale. Listen to the inhale. Listen to the 
listen to the exhale. Embrace your inhale. Embrace your exhale. If you lose awareness of your breath, if you lose awareness of connection with yourself, bring your awareness back to your inhale. Notice the journey of the breath inside the body. Bring your awareness to your exhale. Notice air coming out of the body. As you bring awareness to the breath, notice how it impacts your body. Notice if your breath is bringing more spaciousness, perhaps more calmness, more groundedness. Maybe if it's slowing down the energy in your body. Receive your inhale. Receive your exhale. Feel your inhale, feel it fully. Feel your exhale. Listen to your inhale. Listen to your exhale. Embrace your inhale. Embrace your exhale. Now bring your awareness to the sounds that are here in the room. Footsteps. Breath, slight movements, cough. Bring your awareness to the sounds maybe outside of the room, in the greater space. Bring your awareness back into your body. Notice the sensations in your body. What's present for you in your body right now? What do you notice in your body in this moment, your physical body? Now bring your awareness to your heart in the middle of the chest. What feelings are here? Listen. Receive. Feel. And make room for all the feelings that may be here right now. 
feelings in the heart coming and going, energetic expressions of life, inner communication system. And finally notice once again what it's like to be here in this space together, whether it's physically here in the room or online. Together with a community of people who have come to explore their communication for conscious relating. You are in good company. And that includes the company of yourself. And then very gently, you can open your eyes. Maybe you can look around a little bit to see the good company you're in. Yeah. Yeah, look at the people on Zoom. Beautiful to see your faces. Yeah. And let's just notice that when we are practicing on a regular basis, how to connect to ourselves, we are also practice how to be available for connection with others, meaningful connection, deeper connection with others. Can you feel how the energy has shifted just from whatever it was like a few minutes ago when we started? Can you notice that, the space? Beautiful. So welcome again. Let's step into the river again, a new, a different way. Okay. When we are together in community, we need to set up the conditions for success. And this is something that I learned from Ayurveda. Ayurveda is uh, a, a term in Sanskrit that is translated as the science of life, and it comes from India. And um, in Ayurveda, whenever we engage in any activity, before we engage in some activity, it's useful to think about how do we want to engage in that activity? How do we set the conditions for a successful endeavor? So part of that in these workshops is connecting to ourselves, Part of that was also making sure I could greet you and I could look into your eyes and say hello. Uh, part of that is also as we are in a, um, in a community for a couple of hours is to look at some agreements that we would like to cultivate together and look at the kind of space that we wanna co-create together. I'm not creating the space we are creating the space. And so I wrote some ideas here, and I would like to um, talk about them, some agreements, some multicultural communication agreements for conscious relating that I have been gathering from different streams and that after working with so many people, I see that have been useful. Um, So, The first one, and what we agree to is not to be, I just got a foot cramp. It's not to um, be perfect or an agreement as a bar that we must um, 
hold on to, but more as an anchor of a deep intention to cultivate these agreements. So um, the first one is openness and curiosity. Openness and curiosity to acknowledge that there are different ways of communicating. We are all multicultural beings and we all learn to communicate differently. There are things that are easy for some of us to communicate, things that are hard for some of us to communicate. Can we be open and curious to what is easy or hard for us, what's easy or hard for others, rather than good, bad, right, wrong? And um, the second one is their respect. And when I think of respect, I think of respect for other people's experiences, for, other, uh, for our needs and, uh, and others' needs, for also our capacities and others' capacities. So in this space, we are going to share deeply as the workshops go, uh, as we go into different workshops. And so there may be beautiful tears, all welcome. There may be like roaring laughter, all welcome. There may be, you know, I want to pass, all welcome. Can we respect that? And um, sometimes someone may bring something, you know, we're going to bring our communication struggles, what's difficult for us to communicate. And maybe you think, oh, that's easy for me. So as soon as I see this person putting their shoes on, I'm going to go and tell them how easy it is for me and what they should do so that it's easy for them as well. Well, let's respect other people's capacities that in time, if they have a question and they want to ask you for advice, they'll come and ask you. But I want to invite us all to refrain from giving advice. And that's part of respecting everybody's capacities. Also respecting everybody's ways of knowing and learning. There are different ways in which uh, is conducive to learning for some of us and not for others. Totally fine. So let's, let's be open, curious, and respectful of multiple ways of learning. I also want to call in the cultivation of compassionate understanding. So the word compassion, calm, means with, passion, it comes from Latin, padere, which is pain. It is to be, compassion at a very simple level, is to be with pain. So sometimes we're going to express our pain, our collective pain, our individual pain, and uh, to have that understanding that when someone is communicating their struggles, we want to accompany that person in their pain without taking it on. It is theirs. We also respect their capacities. We acknowledge their capacities. And to also understand that we're all learning. So there are things we're going to say in this space over the, on a monthly basis that may feel triggering to others. And um, let's also have the compassionate understanding that sometimes we may say things that may be uncomfortable to hear. Can we acknowledge that everybody's learning? There's not like one good way of saying things or one or terrible ways of saying things. We're all learning. So yeah, we may, we may say things that are uncomfortable and we have the capacity to have the conversations. That's what we're going to cultivate here so that we can relate to each other consciously and even say, oh, I just feel deep discomfort with what I heard, and that that can be a safe space to be able to say that. So the next one is willingness to explore and try on communication tools that might be outside your comfort zone. We're not going to work here with things that are in our panic zone. We're going to work with what's in our sometimes uncomfortable zone so that we can stretch and grow. And, um, and so this is when I'm going to ask you sometimes, if you're someone you know you tend to share a lot, because that is your preferred way of communication, and that feels really comfortable for you, then 
to hold the discomfort of opening up the space for others' voices to be heard. And if you are someone who usually doesn't share, holds until the last minute when we do, uh, we're going to do some uh, work in groups and with partners, and you always wait for the other person to start first because that's your comfortable place, then invite yourself to have the willingness to be uncomfortable and not go with your preference and be the first one maybe to share something or to go. So that's an invitation. The next one is authority. And that means the word authority is related to the, the root, is related to the word author, to be the author of our lives. So when we share, let's share with the authority about our own experience rather than assuming that everybody's having that experience and sharing and speaking for a group. Um, so, uh, or making assumptions about a group. Then um, I'm inviting us to cultivate transparency. And um, the trust that we can say something, as I said, even if it elicits discomfort, and that that discomfort can be heard. I deeply know that despite the fact that we're living in a very divisive time in our world, in which sometimes families cannot talk about certain things, um, even uh, things that seem basic, because it elicits a lot of uh, discomfort and, and conflict and divisiveness, that this is the space we get to co-create to bring these conversations, and that we can move beyond and find our common humanity. Then I'm calling the um, cultivation of bravery. You know, many of you have been studying about uh, uh, Chogyam Trungpa and the language of spiritual warriorship. And um, when you uh, look at what um, Trungpa talked about in warriorship, it wasn't the making of war which starts with aggression and violence and divisiveness. But it's actually, it's a translation from a Tibetan word that means bravery. And I much prefer the word bravery than warrior or warriorship. In fact, I'm not personally interested in cultivating a warrior of anything. I want to be a, an activator, inspire, mediator, uh, upstander of peace and love and union and connection and bravery. So um, then we have uh, belonging and warmth. And that is uh, sometimes we base our belonging on others. So when we are in a group, we're like, oh, I don't feel like I belong because others seem different. Let's cultivate the idea that we bring our sense of belonging to any group we're a part of. Because we're whole, we're wholesome, we're good, essentially good. We are enough, just like everybody else. Most of all, we're all members of this beautifully diverse human family. So let's bring that sense of belonging and warmth. And. Um, I have four more, <laughs> humility and maturity. And the humility to understand that sometimes, even though we may say things with the greatest intentions, the impact that our words will have may be negative. And to have the humility to accept that we want to make a space to hear the impact our words have, rather than conquer and hold on and grasp to have the other person who feels hurt or uncomfortable understand our good intention. So that requires humility and it requires maturity. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So sometimes when we say something, I may be saying something right now and you may feel uncomfortable with what I said. So then let's say that you come and tell me, Alejandra, I feel uncomfortable with what you said. And then I launch into an explanation. Oh, but you shouldn't feel uncomfortable because 
I, I'm a safe person and I really want to connect and I really want to um, be here to share these beautiful work and on and on and on. So what I'm doing now is I'm going on and on about my good intentions instead of making room for you to express your discomfort with me. And in order to do that, that requires humility, that our words sometimes will elicit discomfort, and it requires the maturity to say, it's not about me. I can keep my good intentions within myself. If you're telling me you're uncomfortable, if you're telling me you're hurt, I need to make space for you. So does that make it clear? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, and questions are, you know, questions, comments, objections, all welcome all the time. <laughs> um, okay, then I have um, equality to participate and give space for others to participate. Listen with presence and curiosity rather than planning what we're going to say next. Or, uh, or thinking about what we're going to say. And uh, confidentiality, to talk about when you come out of this room, to talk about your own experience. What did you learn? What did you experience? Rather than identifying others. And then finally, um, oh, we have, yes, authenticity. We, talk about, we talked about authorship and then diversity. Our communication is so much richer when we're able to open up to the diversity of communication styles, cultures, layers of cultures, and different ways of understanding and learning about the world. So I want to ask before we continue, does anybody object to my invitation to cultivate these values and agreements? On Zoom or here, no, I see in Zoom people saying no. Okay, beautiful. Wow, that, that was easy. Okay, <laughs> okay. So let's start by um, talking a little bit about um, conscious relating because as you, as you saw in the title, Language Alchemy gives you communication tools for conscious relating. Most of us, how do we, I, and I have a question for all of you, how do we relate to other people? How do we relate to ourselves? How do we relate to life? I see some smiles. What do you think? How do we relate? Listening for commonality. Yeah, we listen for what's common. What do we have in common? Mm -hmm. We relate that way. How else do we relate? Paying attention. Paying attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How else do we relate? We laugh and play. We laugh and play. Yes. Yeah, so through emotions and in order to laugh and play, we need to feel safe and relaxed, right? Mm-hmm. Body language. Yes. And when we talk about language alchemy, we're not just talking about verbal language words. We're also talking about body language, gestures, micro gestures, tone of voice, you know? It's not the same to say, Ron, 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 Ron. Not the same, right? Just one word, body language, can convey so many different meanings. So we relate through tone of voice as well. How else do we relate? Yes, we relate through touch, absolutely. And um, in different cultures, different families where we have, where it depends on how we have been raised, touch and distance is different. So for, for some of us, I, I had friends, whenever they needed to talk to me, they were touching my arm, my elbow, and I was like, I'm not ready for that, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and some people, they need a lot of distance and different kind of touch. So yeah, we relate through touch. Um, sensing for safety. Yes. Watching for threat, you know? Sensing for safety and watching for threat, yes two things that are uh, part of our brain development as we came into the world. And we are going to talk in one of our weeks about, um, we're going to talk about safety a lot, but we're going to talk about 
um, those two core relational needs that we all have that are safety and connection. Yes. Online I'm always assessing the situation. So similar. similar, yes, assessing, yes, assessing the situation, yes. Most of these things that we do in order to relate, and of course we relate through verbal language, right, speaking, communicating, most of the things that we use for relating have been learned. Most of the ways in which we relate to others is a repetition of what we have learned or a repetition of the modeling we saw and that we learned either explicitly or implicitly. So then you may ask, so how do we relate to each other consciously if we're just constantly repeating and the more we have repeated ways of relating, the more these ways have become habits. So how do we relate to one another consciously? Well, that's what we're going to learn here. First, by bringing awareness to our habits, to our patterns, and to noticing some things that we have not noticed before. So first of all, let's learn that it takes about uh, according to linguists, seven years of life to get the download of a language. And by download, I don't just mean calling this a bottle or the bell that I just remember I forgot to ring at the end of meditation <laughs> or at the beginning. <laughs> you know, we learn to communicate during these seven years of life what to say when someone gives us this bottle as a gift, how to express gratitude or how to doubt your intentions for giving me this as a gift when I don't have a gift to give you back? Or uh, what do you want from me? Are you going to ask me for a favor later on? Or, uh, wow, you give me a bottle that has a dent? Uh, don't, don't you know that Oh, no, it's an ergonomic thing to put my thumb. How thoughtful of you. So we have, we have learned how to communicate, not just with words naming things, but we have learned how to communicate our feelings, how to communicate our beliefs and our thoughts, and how to imitate the whole download of that language. Questions, comment, comments, objections? Yes. Um, so you said it takes seven years. How did you say that? It takes seven years to get the download of a language. So by the age of seven, most of us, most children, will know what to say out loud and how to communicate when they feel angry or sad, scared, grateful, vulnerable, uh, ask for help or not ask for help. Uh, touch, not touch, scan the environment for safety, what is safety, what is threat, uh, certain beliefs about themselves and the world. It takes about seven years. And then what happens is that we keep repeating that. And especially when we have relationships with those closest to us, family members, uh, romantic partners, um, close friends, we repeat these ways in which we have learned to relate. Fascinating, isn't it? So most of us, we could say that unless we look at how we're relating through communication, we are relating in habitual ways. We're just repeating what we have learned. Do you want an example? Okay. So, um, I, uh, as soon as I uh, got married, probably, which was in 2005, so almost 20 years ago, uh, my husband and I had an argument, and I don't know, I, I don't remember what the, what the issue was, but it was, it was a big argument. And so I, I was living in San Francisco, I left the house, I was furious, and how could he do this or say this or whatever? So I left the house 
and I went into a yoga class. Laughing Lotus, does anybody know or remember that place? Yeah. So I went into a yoga class, and as I was there in the yoga class, I was in the back because I didn't want to bring my energy to the whole group. And uh, But I was crying. I was furious. I was like... Inhale, upward dog. Exhale, downward dog. I was really, you know, like I was in it. But then through yoga and the movement of my body, I started crying, sobbing, going through all these different feelings. And then I came out of the yoga class. I was with my mat crossing Dolores Street. And I realized something. Oh, I, the way I just communicated to my husband... Um, it's actually exactly the same way my parents communicated to one another when they were upset with each other. Oh, and I've been doing this not just with him, but with everybody when I get upset, which is leave, silent treatment, do not communicate, do not express that I'm upset, just disappear. And uh, when I realized that, I realized, wow, and, um, you know, um, yeah, I've been doing this with him. And then I had a memory of our wedding in which we said all these beautiful things to one another. There was no way I could uphold our intentions of marriage if I kept communicating that way. Then I also realized my husband is a lawyer. He went to school to learn how to argue. I will never win an argument with him. And then I further realized, wait a minute, if I show up to win an argument, there will always be a loser. And that's not the kind of partnership I want. So realizing all these things, then I kept walking. You know, I was walking. I lived above the Castro, so I was walking uphill, and then I realized, oh, and I further learned to communicate this way, meaning feel upset, say nothing, leave, and disappear, ghost you from life. I've lost many ways that way, many friends that way. Um, what I also realized was, oh, and that is the accepted way in my culture growing up in Latin America, in Argentina, as a female, uh, that is the way that was accepted and also that was um, um, embraced. And I got a lot of praise for that as a female to not show discontent in the moment, say nothing, keep your composure, and then disappear. So when I realized all that, I was like, wow, that was... That moment is when language alchemy was born, because that moment is when I realized I need to find a way to learn to communicate differently and to communicate as myself, not to keep repeating what I have learned from my different la layers of culture and from the family I grew up in and what they taught me how to communicate during conflict. So I had to learn to be able to say, I feel really angry with you right now, and I want to leave, but I'm going to stay, and I feel really uncomfortable. I had to learn to say this. It just felt so vulnerable for me to be able to say this at the beginning to my husband. And then to be able to say, I feel very upset. I don't understand what you just said. I feel like I want to leave. I want to stay, and I want to make room for you to... Tell me why you said what you said. That was like years later, being able to say that. And then be able to say, wow, when I just heard that, my stomach sunk. And I feel so much tension in my shoulders. Wow, and I feel so hot right now, beloved Matthew, and I'm, I am furious with you. And I want to stay here. I do not want to leave, and I want to make space for what I'm feeling, and I want to make space for you. More years to be able to say that. Very different from what I had learned to communicate. 
So does that, is that example useful? So I'm going to ask you now to consider what is easy for you to communicate. And I'm going to actually ask you to do some writing. I'd love to ask you to, um, I'd, I'd love for you to write maybe like a list of what feels easy for you to say out loud, to communicate to anybody. You can also divide it into three fields. Anybody you meet at work, at home, with your closest people. What feels easy? And I'm going to give you some examples of what might feel easy to communicate. Yes. Um, the folks who picked up uh, pads or the clipboard and paper, I um, think they would be willing to share some of the sheets of either mine or unlike paper because there were fewer of them than clipboards. Thank you. There's no more sheets here. Uh, 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 no, I all the sheets. Um, and then there are three pads out there, so if people want to find paper, that is Any what? A sheet <laughs> that you can grab? Yeah. Yes. Can someone give Jesse a sheet, too? A sheet and a clipboard. And a clipboard, please. And a pen. <laughs> and a pen. And a full massage? Yeah, that would be wonderful. And again, if you need to stretch, feel free, you know, stretch. So I'm going to give you some examples of some things that might feel easy to communicate. It may be easy to describe concepts, ideas. It may feel easy to make small talk. It may feel easy to talk about your thoughts or give opinions, give advice. It may feel easy to talk about your feelings or to talk to others about the future, your dreams, your projects, or to talk about the past, to talk about only happy memories of the past, to talk about how the past was better than the present moment, or to talk about the painful past. It may feel easy to talk about our trauma. It may feel easy to vent and complain, to gossip. It may feel easy to talk about what we love or to express love out loud. It may be easy to say I'm sorry and apologize or express remorse. It may be easy to always take the blame. It was my fault. You know, there's something wrong with me. It may be really easy to talk about yourself. It may be easy to talk about others. For some of us, it may be easy to talk about our strengths, our achievements, our accomplishments, who we know, that, especially if they're famous, important, something like that. Uh, it may be easy to talk about our capacities, all the things we're able to do, have been able to do. It may be easy to have superficial conversations about the weather or situational things, current events. Yes. Um, you mentioned three groups. You could you could make it into three groups, or you can make a list first, and then we can do. Yeah. Uh, communication with anybody. Communication at work communication at home with your most intimate others. So you can make a list first and then you can say, oh, this is easy with everybody. Oh, no, this is, you know, you can make a, your choice. Uh, 
may be easy to talk about, uh, for some of us, it's easy to talk about our failures and our limitations, our weaknesses. Uh, mistakes, what we did, quote unquote, wrong, how, quote unquote, bad we are. Or um, for some of us, it may be easy to talk about positive things. For some of us, it may be easy to talk about negative things. And for some of us, it may be easy to talk about our fears and doubts and overwhelm and stress. And you may find other things that are easy for you to communicate, to talk about gratitude, um, certain feelings, not others. Yes, Connie. What do you think? Does your body need to eat a bar? Yes. Yeah, Let, let's honor your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever you need. Again, like, do you need to stand up? Do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you need tea, water, eat something? Please take care of her. Honor your body. Okay, so do you need more time with what you're writing? Yeah? Okay, let's give you more time. So what we're doing right now is the one of the prongs of language alchemy, bringing awareness. And then we're going to work with the communication approach to this, and then we're going to move to the evolutionary activism aspect of it. So that's what we're doing now. We're bringing awareness to how, what's easy for us to communicate. And I would love if you are willing to uh, say out loud, you know, like in popcorn style and people on Zoom as well, just to say out loud, what, um, what are some things that, you know, you wrote? Like just say one thing. Stories. stories. Easy to talk, of, communicate stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do I need to repeat for the people on Zoom? Oh. No. Um, well, for the. Oh, they can hear it. Okay, great. Okay. Or there's a mic too. If you want to take a mic. Um, yeah. If anybody winds up being quiet and um, and the Zoom folks ask for it, we'll start using the mic. But if we're if we're if they're able to hear us, then we'll just keep going with that. Yeah, please, please ask if uh, the people on Zoom if you need, yeah, mic. Okay, so what's easy to communicate? Talking about plans or strategies. Mm, plans or strategies. What I did last week or over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Complain. Complain. Yeah, thank you. What's your, what's your name, I think? Michael. Thank you, Michael. two connections or to talk about like the overarching meta mm -hmm. concept, but once things have multiple interconnections I get more lost uh -huh. to the, the simplest or the big or, picture or, yeah overarching which is yeah. kind of like over oversimplification description 
don't know, memes. <laughs> yeah, memes. <laughs> yeah. The ideal level yeah. things. Yeah. So yeah. The meta level, yeah. It's easy to listen and give empathy. Empathy, giving empathy, listening and giving empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joys that create connection. Joys. Mm -hmm. Compliments. Compliments. Yeah. Some of our minds are positive things. Positive things. Something I'm learning about myself or something I just learned mm. that I also think might be helpful. Ah. Yes. Yes, something we're learning about ourselves that we think might be helpful to the other. Yes. Or not even about myself, but just something I just learned that I want to remember, but I also thought, oh, maybe this will be helpful to you. As well. Yeah, yeah. So good to know that. Notice. And that just reminded me that if I'm passionate, the, 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 the passion and the excitement yeah. that comes out. Mm hmm. I don't like this about myself, but I think gossip is very easy. Gossip is easy, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a way to bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. It's embarrassing, but it's really easy to talk about myself, what I'm doing, what I'm doing. Yeah. Into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how many people find it easy to do that? Just, just look around. Welcome to the human family. Yay! <laughs> You're one of us, Ron. It feels narcissistic saying it. It feels narcissistic I mean, saying it, yeah. Saying it, but knowing it. Yeah. It feels less narcissistic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and, and you know what's beautiful is that what I, what I usually say is like when we find these things about ourselves, like, you know, Connie, you were saying, oh, it's embarrassing to admit it's easy to talk about gossip. However, if we keep that out of our awareness, then we are perpetuating more suffering, more disconnection. So I want to invite us all to be actually confident and proud that we're seeing these things, because this is the gateway to liberation. If we don't see it, if we don't say it out loud, how are we going to liberate ourselves from them? You know, if we just keep, keep them for ourselves and do nothing about it, then we keep ourselves relating in unconscious, habitual ways. So, Noam, you had a, your hand yeah, up. There are two online. One uh, person said they, it's easy for them to share their opinions and give advice. To share their opinions and give advice. Mm -hmm. and the other one said that it's hard to admit that Negative things and past trauma. Yeah. And I would just add, similar to what someone else said, uh, sharing information and you know, sort of intellectual things. Intellectual information and things, data, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, and I, this is gender-based, but I think it's easy to maybe self-deprecating. Self-deprecating, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're going to talk about all these layers of culture that impact our communication, mm -hmm. how we were raised as women, you know, given kudos for being self-deprecating. Jimmy, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking of what Ron had said, because it's really easy for me to talk about myself as well. And it's been something... What I've learned in the last several years is that that's okay. That's that's a good thing on on a certain level, but only <laughs> if I include other people in that. In in other words, not just talk about myself. Right. If I'm also able to ask questions. If I'm also able to 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 make observations about other things and talk about it it's okay to talk about myself but not to the exclusion of everything else. right as long as i include other stuff too yes then it's okay yeah and we make room and that is having awareness of equity and equality right. in our interactions what how do our how are we bringing equity by pro 
also making space for others and not being the ones that we talk all the time and then we talk only about ourselves. But it's sort of like what you said before, if we ignore these things about ourselves, then we don't learn how to make them okay yeah. by, in, in this case, by bringing other sorts of conversation into my life. Yeah. So it's not just all about me all the time. Yeah. Because it would be. If... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, so perfect. Any, anything else that anybody wants to put in the space, Marlene? The longer I travel, the more I travel, the more it's what you present to me that you are into hearing what your level of safety because it's so situational. Yeah. What, what culture do I find myself in? If I'm in Latin America, if I'm in a Pacific Rim country, you have the differences. What are you expressing to me that is okay for me to express back to you? Mm. What, if I am expressing it, are you presenting any sort of like, hey, that's beyond, and what, how do I shift all of that? So it feels very like whatever si the situation says is okay it becomes much easier to right so and it's like kind of like um what you were saying like that tracking of what is safe for you so then i can talk about this or what's not safe for you and how are you perceiving me so that then oh i cannot talk about certain things it feels interesting to have gender brought up because i was taught to make myself safe for other people right because i'm was raised male. Yes. It's like, how do you create the safety specifically for women to be able to express themselves right. to me? Mm -hmm. Fascinating when you brought that up because it really had me thinking down that track. Yes. And so this is how we see that language and culture, they go hand in hand teaching us how to communicate. And you may think, oh, that's a personal characteristic. That's what makes me, Merlin, communicate in this way without acknowledging the social constructs and uh, impositions that have been put on you because you uh, came to this world in a male body and you were raised uh, as a male. Yeah, okay. So now my question is, look at that list. You know, you, you can do like, is it work? First, uh, everybody or uh, intimate relationships. Now, now you can do that, like, you know, put them in a, in a group. Is it the same? Or are you finding differences? Some things are easy for me to talk about work, but not with my closest others. So what do you notice? With work people, I really only talk about work. Right. Work people only about work. Mm hmm Yeah. I find it very easy to be open online and share things with complete strangers that I've never met versus expressing certain emotions to like my best friend or my partner and certain emotions that maybe I'm more comfortable expressing to people that I don't know intimately and I notice I get very self-conscious when I'm expressing something, especially if it's something I don't want to feel or if that makes me uncomfortable. I will get embarrassed that I feel it in general, so to express it to someone who really knows me and right. up in me is, it feels more vulnerable than sharing with people that I've never met. Exactly. And how many of us do that? Express certain things, deep things about ourselves with strangers, whether it's online, and the online environment provides that, right? I don't have to look at you. I don't have to be in your presence. I don't have to feel the vulnerability of saying these things out loud. I can just, you know, type them with my thumbs and, um, and feel the safety in that. And that becomes easy rather than doing it in person. Yeah, or with the closest other. That's interesting because they always say like when people can share online anonymously, they're much meaner, like about the story of the trolling goes on. Yeah. People are anonymous. And it's stuff that people would never say in real life, but it's just mean and personal. Yes, and, and so trolling, so easy, right, to do online and when people share anonymously, as you said, Connie all this research that people can be meaner or, you know, uh, cruel, uh, but not if they attach their names and their pictures or if they say it on a video, you know. 
and the opposite is true like people being like um finding it easier to be like uh, more fake in a video if you will like more positive sunnier than uh perhaps you know if they were to write write feedback i don't know written format so okay so now i have a question for you why is it easy for you to communicate these things or why is it easy for you to communicate these things with people at work or with your intimate others or strangers with everybody why communication or what uh, I've taken to calling the container, like the just full description about agreements. And the shared expectation, what does that mean, Tia? Well, it means I'm making a bunch of assumptions. However, like that, that there are implicit assumptions about what's okay at work, or there are implicit assumptions about what's okay in this kind of relationship or that kind of relationship. And yeah, I tried to poke around with that. But that, that, that's what allows it to be easy for me. Yes, and going or guessing that happens. Right. And and so you're pointing to something crucial. You have learned what the rules are. You have <laughs> Yes, well, but these how do you know about these expectations? When you were a baby learning to communicate before the age of seven? Watching people do it right and watching people do it wrong. Yes. I mean and by wrong I mean successfully or unsuccessfully. Right. And it was, so what's easy for us to communicate is what we have learned to communicate and what's been modeled for us that is considered easy. We have considered that easy. We've seen it before. We've learned it before. It didn't come from us. Michael. Family. Familiarity and safety. And how did you get that familiarity and safety? learned you learned those things from the earlier environment your first communication teachers caregivers parents uh, early education teachers society how we were raised all these layers have taught us what now we consider it's easy for us to communicate and how we show up Remind me your name? Nitra. 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 Net yes, Nitra. Nitra. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the kind of layering of these things over the course of a life. And yes. Um, listening was easy because I was, you know, gendered and socialized to listen. And then I went into a profession in anthropology where <coughs> listening was my profession. And then I became a coach. Again, you know, it's like, so like training becomes mapped on to early socialization. Yes. But what's really interesting to me also is that in that process of growing, I was forced to learn things that were very uncomfortable and moving across culture, I was forced to do things. Mm -hmm. And so certain capacities, like it's easier for me to draw boundaries at work because I have to learn how to do it. But it's much harder to do it with my family. Yes. <laughs> And so, yeah, it's malleable and then it keeps shifting, but all stuff keeps kind of shaping the way that um, skills also get acquired. Right. And why is it harder to draw boundaries with your family, but it's easier at work? Because at work, you've learned that that's accepted, that's okay, right? That's professional, perhaps other people do that too. It's been modeled to you, but perhaps with your family, that's not something that's expected to you, of you, or maybe if you do, you are um, in some way like punished. Yeah, for me specifically, the work part, because I run my own practice, um, it was very difficult to do it. Yeah. So that was like a process of empowerment and skill building. Yes. And uh, touching a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but with family, there's massive backlash. That's right. So. Massive backlash with family. Yes, yeah, so you've learned uh, communicating boundaries with family. Uh, no, it's very hard because then lack of safety. I'm non-belonging, I'm going to get this backlash that's massive, right? So, and then you brought something very important. 
which is the greatest news I have for you today. What you have learned to communicate doesn't have to keep being so. You can learn to communicate differently. Because all of us, when we came to the world, we came with the ability to communicate. The language we use is mostly a repetition of what we've heard, what we have seen as acceptable. However, we can learn to communicate differently. Because the language, the language we speak, what we find easy communicating, is something we have learned. So we can expand our learning. Isn't that amazing? Seriously, like we don't have to stay. We don't have to keep relating to others in the way we have always related to until this moment, habitually. We can learn new ways because the ways in which we relate is something we have learned. Don't you have like a like a an emoji with like a head explosion? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's both. It's exciting and it's scary, you know. Like in the example I was giving you uh, with me and Matthew and in our first year of marriage, it was scary to say, I'm upset and I want to stay. <laughs> and I'm, I want to leave, but I also want to stay here with you. It was really scary to say that. But the more you say it, then the easier it is and the more you hear yourself out loud and that's why i ask you first right so what are we doing there connecting to ourselves then say it out loud because the way we learn to communicate is not just by writing things it is by hearing our own voice our own voice carries resonance energy and our neo our the back of our brain, that's the one that's constantly scanning for safety, when we hear things out loud, we are communicating to the back of our brain, we've already said it, we've survived, maybe we can say it again, we're not going to get killed. Yes, no, I'm someone... Yes. Get to the, you can get to the point. I, I found myself at a point where I wasn't even aware of my own feelings. It's not that I wasn't able to communicate, right. but I didn't even know what they were. Right. They had been so thoroughly repressed. Exactly. So taking a moment to stop and say, What am I feeling here? Can I communicate? Yes. That is a, a big part of the, of the, of the change process. Absolutely. And you're bringing up something crucial of why language alchemy is different than other communication approaches. Other communication approaches may start with giving you a list of feelings to communicate or giving you a list of things to say, or in this situation, say this or say that. But as a spiritual practitioner, when we connect deeper and deeper to ourselves, we may say something that has no true significance to us. Just because we're following a formula, it's not our authentic expression. It's more authentic to say, I have no idea what my feelings are. I have not been taught how to communicate feelings. What are feelings? They've been repressed. So to be able to learn to communicate that, I first need to know what feelings are. Are they in my body? Are they in my heart? Are they in my head? And then perhaps we can talk about how we can start communicating them. Also, in different cultures, we communicate feelings differently. Sometimes we communicate feelings through a metaphor, not just a feeling word. So finding an auth our authentic expression is finding what are our habits, being aware of that, and then knowing how to, what's the next step? What do we need to grow in order to communicate more consciously, not just repeating the way we have learned? So, and then the online comment is that it's easier to correct my own children, even, are, even as adults, than other people. Yeah, easier to, co to <clears throat> correct my own children, e even as adults, than co to correct other people. Yeah, because again, perhaps the role of being a parent in society has been accepted that it's a corrective role. You know, I usually say to parents, 
connect. Well, I say to everybody, connect and then correct. Because if we move to correction without the connection, then uh, we could be uh, disrespecting other people's capacities. We could be communicating in a way that elicits more triggers, more um, divisiveness. So let's first connect, and then we can correct, if there's space for that. Maybe the other person has no room for that. Yeah, OK. So I want to ask you to make another list now. What is hard for you to communicate? <laughs> Did you know we were going to go there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm going to repeat the list that I uh, shared with you earlier. Because what some people find easy to communicate, some people have hard to communicate. Is it hard for you to describe concepts, ideas, abstract things, data, information? and be clear. Is it hard to engage in small talk? Is it hard to talk about your thoughts? Or to express your opinions out loud? Is it hard to talk with people one-on-one? -on -one? Or is it hard to talk to people in groups? Is it hard to communicate your feelings? Once you know what your feelings are. Is it hard to talk about your dreams and projects and the future and visions, positive vision of what you like to do, plans? Is it hard to talk about the past, the past experiences, whether it was a positive past or a negative past? Or in places where it would be safe, is it hard to talk about trauma? Or is it hard to um, talk about venting and complaining? Is it hard to gossip? Hard to talk about how much to express your love for others. Is it hard to express apology or remorse? Or hard to talk about making a mistake or having limitations? Is it hard to talk about your strengths, your achievements, your capacities, your abilities? Is it hard to talk about your fears and um, your doubts? Is it hard to give compliments? Or to acknowledge, um, express gratitude and acknowledge uh, what other people, how other people are helping, supporting you, contributing to you? Is it hard to give advice when someone asks you for advice? 
<laughs> Is it hard to be sarcastic, ironic? <laughs> For some people, it's easy. Hard to make jokes, have humor. So, let's hear it from people. What's hard? It's hard to communicate with a group when I get a different read per person. When you get, different right. Read per person makes it very hard for me to feel comfortable. Yeah. How it's going to land, and that's been drilled into me is very important. Yeah, and it has to do with what you shared earlier, you know, because constantly assessing, are others feeling safe with me? So, I can't imagine how taxing it is in a group when you're assessing Every single person get a read. For... Yeah. Mm. Thank you. We're going to talk about that sensation in a minute, so remind me, okay? Okay. Or not. Yeah. No. From online one, it's hard, difficult to talk to someone about particular subject know that it might be a trigger for them. Yeah. And the other one is a more general it's hard to talk about feelings. Feelings. Feelings and things that might be triggering for the other. Yeah. How many of us are afraid to say something for fear of offending the other? Yeah, making it triggering for the other. Yeah. The other will get upset. I didn't get your name. Laura. Laura. Hi. Hi. It's hard for me to ask for things if they're not offered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to wait for others to offer it, and if not, do you ask, or sometimes? Sometimes I just give up. Give up. Back away. Yeah, back away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I find it hard to talk uh, with like, strangers work, or even just friends that I'm not close with about actually my life, because I feel like they might think it's boring. Mm. So it's more mostly like I find myself asking them questions and they can just go on and talk and great. Yeah, exactly. So so you and Ron can have like a good dialogue. <laughs> it's interesting to notice like what feels easy to some people is hard for other people. Yeah? Yeah. Or Jimmy, like you can ask him lots of questions, right? <laughs> if we are going to continue communicating habitually which, you know, most of us, again, do. We communicate most of the ways in which we relate to others and communicate is not conscious, it's habitual. So bringing that awareness and having that humor, oh, like, this is what I do. Okay, oops, I did it again. Okay, let's try something different. It's a compassionate understanding of ourselves. Michael. Feeling hard to talk about feeling left out. Mm hmm Yeah. Thank you. Tia? Um, I realized uh, uh, I realized I wrote love on the easy side and because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for tell your friends you love them, make it weird, like, more love in the world, do the thing. Um, so in terms of, like, connection and support and, like, all the different kinds of meanings of what love means, and then the most intimate romantic relationships there are, I cannot talk about, uh, there, there's a whole section of desires that I can mm. not verbalize. And um, I, I just realized, writing it down now, that it's the container. I don't trust the container, ah. which is hard to say because I feel like I've worked on that, like that has been like life work. Over right. And, and uh, clearly I've missed it, I don't know, my mind somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Or perhaps, instead of missing it, perhaps you haven't learned, it has not been taught for you to trust the container. Or perhaps there were experiences at a young age when you were underdeveloped to trust the container that the container could be trusted. Yeah, all of these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pauline. I can't talk about when I'm upset or angry, especially mm. with friends. With friends, yeah. So what do, what do you usually do? Do you do what I used to do? I stuff or, it down. You stuff it down, yeah. yeah. So you pretend everything is okay? I do, and I sort of take it on myself to 
justifying why I shouldn't be angry. Oh, yes. And then the internal dialogue justifying I should not be angry. So it's kind of like, um, you know, like self gaslighting. Yeah, I should not be angry. I should not be sad. This should not be happening. I should be differently. Mm -hmm. I didn't get your name. Yeah, Axel. Axel? Axel. Axel. I, I find it hard to uh, combine my feelings and then sharing them in groups. Yeah. Right now I feel very nervous. Yes, right now you feel very nervous. Can I ask you a question? So first of all, thank you for sharing that you feel very nervous. Can you, would you be willing to tell us where is that nervousness inside of you, in your body? Right from the heart, like here. Yeah, in your, yeah. Okay, thank you. What are you feeling there? Like, what's that sensation like? Yes. Yeah, you're learning that. So something that is difficult to describe that's here, and somehow you know that that um, communication system that you're having in your body is uh, telling you this is what nervousness feels like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mar Marlon, you talked about sensations, right? Like. It's a sensation when you are trying to track everybody and for everybody to see how everybody will respond to you and are they, do they feel safe? What's that sensation like? The sensation is not wanting to cause harm, but a lot of self-doubt as well. A lot of self-doubt. Yeah, I was raised around primarily women, and then I saw a lot of men hurting women that I loved. Oh. So I, like, I have this incredible self-examinatory, am I doing it wrong? Mm. And then I also, because I'm a human being and I have made mistakes, then there's the self-judgment that right. comes along with, can I even trust my own anything? Right. So then, okay, so how do I then assess my impact in the moment and that feeling if I can, oh, so this is who, this is who you are as a, and where your comfort zone is and, a, and all the little qualifiers we put on an mm -hmm. action and I can relax into that. It never goes away, but I can sort of relax into that. When it's a large group, that feeling is bouncing off of 50 or 100 or 200 people based on how many people I'm talking to. Mm. Yeah. It's like popcorn. That never popcorn. Stops popping inside. Yeah. yeah. Sure that will come up. Yeah, thank you. Are you noticing it right now? A that popcorn? Bit, yeah. Yeah. I think, what? Um, anytime I can control a narrative, it drops down a little bit. So mm. that sense of personal safety. Yeah. So one thing I also notice is anything that feels out of place or doesn't make sense is incredibly hard to relax into a conversation around. Mm -hmm. so if I can't rock why it belongs in this conversation, I would be silent. Silent, yeah. And just let the conversation happen around me because I don't feel grounded in what's happening now. Yeah, around me. thank you. And when you don't feel grounded in what's happening, like what do you notice in your body? Silence. Inside. Yeah. Or, or, or is there like chatter going inside? Like, oh, I'm trying to figure it out. But okay. I, I learned from very, very young that figuring out is being quiet mm. and then trying to track individual trends until, okay, this is wow. what we're doing. Most, you know, I was very displaced often. But yeah. I travel a very great deal. Right. So I'll find myself in another culture and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. And the only way to really do that is to, to you know, put a fork in the pile and allow yourself to understand what's happening just allow it to show you where the correct way to move forward is so yeah um, i feel so grateful that you took the cork out here with us seriously it's it's such an honor thank you because you've learned that you can only figure things out by yourself i do this for a living like my actual work yeah. is to Right. Isn't it amazing how we choose these careers that, you know, like you were talking about, like you choose that career and you had to learn to set boundaries in that career, but it, your career that you chose was like, learn, you, you didn't even have to learn to listen your career because that's something you have already learned and has been, you know, taught to you in your communication. Yeah. Connie. Um, I think my family was really bad to the bragging or to demand a lot of attention. So then 
So I would really hard for me to talk about myself, but you were saying, you know, I'm really comfortable asking questions, and now I'm a journalist, so that's like, well done. <laughs> and, but my kids will say to me, Mom, stop asking follow-up questions. I just want to know more. Right. Too, so. But it's just... Yeah, and then, but, but we should have your kids talk to my husband. <laughs> he says the same thing. Stop asking me for a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jimmy? A, a lot of what's been said ties into one of my biggest difficulties is talking about my vulnerability, where I'm vulnerable, where, and it, it has to do with not being able to ask for help, not being able to express what my needs are, not being able to express what I want, um, not being able to talk about certain feelings of loneliness. Yeah. Um, not being able to talk about my sexuality, yeah. not being able to talk about, um, oftentimes about aging mm -hmm. at this point in my life. And it, it also, not being able to talk about my failures, things that have gone wrong in my life in an honest kind of way mm. without, you know, either justifying or explaining or making light of it mm -hmm. or this is why and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But that vulnerable, being vulnerable is, it's, you know, that's, I was the youngest of five kids and you couldn't. That's right. I couldn't show any kind of vulnerability at all. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I learned the rules of engagement in my family pretty quickly because everybody was already doing it by the time I showed up and had been doing it for a while. Right. So the lessons were coming hot and fast. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really, it's, in, it's ingrained. And now having had the opportunity over the last, last couple decades really to start changing some of that stuff is this is, thank you for, you know, for bringing. Yeah. This, and I'm really glad that we shifted over into what's difficult. I was worried there. <laughs> you were worried for a minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what were you worried about? That we weren't going to get there. Oh, yeah, we, we weren't going to get, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. About vulnerability, like I'm legally blind and I've been dealing with this disability for over 20 years and so I have such a small amount of eyesight so just being able to be like I'm vulnerable in every situation that I'm in, especially physically when I walk into a space I don't know who's around me, I don't know what's around me, it's very uncomfortable. So then trying to find that ease just physically so that then I can be emotionally vulnerable with myself and with others and right. connect and know that I'm safe physically so I can be safe emotionally. Yeah. Very, very tricky, you know, so I'm always trying to find a way to like find harmony with being vulnerable and not being so afraid and even now as I speak about it my voice shakes and my palms sweat it's mm -hmm. very uncomfortable but I found that's the only way that I can come to terms with my disability and also just with my human emotions just right. trying to breathe with those sensations and know okay that my hands are shaking I'm very uncomfortable being open but that's what makes me more connected to myself and to other people and to my space and allows me to actually be vulnerable and, and relax a little bit into that feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And what is it like right now to feel that vulnerability, as you were saying? My hands are sweating. I'm, you know, my voice is shaking. What is it like inside? What are you noticing inside in your body? very scary but like this is something that I, I speak about my disability to hundreds of people like on yeah. stages and things like that and with uh, like social media 
So I'm very used to this feeling and I kind of thrive off of it. I think that I've always told myself like the opposite of depression, I get very depressed and it's always the opposite for me is expression. Mm -hmm. so I hold it all in and the second I start to let it unravel and let myself shake and let myself talk about it, even now I, I settle more into my body and into those feelings and it doesn't feel as scary. It's, it's, it becomes more of like the mountain that I stand on in a form of strength for me Beautiful. rather than, um, you know, being pregnant. Yeah, so in the beginning when you started speaking, your palms were sweating and your voice was shaking. How about now? Can you check in inside? My nerves and everything just lowering a little bit more. I'm mm. just feeling more at ease, and I can breathe a little deeper and let my let it out a little more. And, uh, but it's nice. I feel like I've only noticed that I can do that through expression. Yes. Yeah. And what you are describing, what where we are getting to here, is that if we want to take the first step at communicating consciously rather than habitually, we need to pay attention to what's happening in the physical body. Because the physical body is the first layer of communication. It's the most immediate communication system that we have available to us that for most of us has been repressed. We haven't learned to do that. Uh, we have learned how more like uh, how to in these modern societies how to express our head but not how to go inside the body how many of you remember going to school or having your parents when you were young tell you so how is that in your body or, you, or reading a story and asking you so do you see how this character feels scary if you feel scared, how, what happens for you when you feel scared? What happens inside? <laughs> That's funny, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Tia? I definitely didn't have any in your body ones, but I had maybe something close to the, like, not quite as intentional as like, oh, let's use scared as, a, as an idea, but um, definitely the, like, analogies of how fiction particularly can relate to looking at your own life like that, mm -hmm. that, was, that you that had was, that was beautiful for sure yeah um, beautiful so not not maybe so specifically but really right. generally and really regularly right now but no in your body. <laughs> exactly not in your body how many of you have heard in school or from you know your first communication teachers um can you um, tell me the three things you learned about this? Or can you compare and contrast? Or can you put these things into categories? Can you name things like alphabet numbers? And um, can you label things? How many of you have had that teaching, right? Sesame Street, <laughs> right. Right, and I think uh, Mr. Rogers was the one who's like, what is it like in your body? You know, and he had to testify in Congress to say this is the kind of programs we need for children, right? Um, we need this uh, funding for these kind of programs. But most of us, when we came to the world, we experienced the world through our bodies. That's the first language that we had internally, even when we couldn't express it out loud, something happened in our bodies, so much so that we explored the, our world through our bodies, through touch, you know, you see like little babies putting things in their mouth, like putting everything in their mouth and their parents like taking that off, or wanting to, you know, uh, whether they're crawling or walking, like they want to touch things, like you were talking about touch. So, um, and uh, really listening and paying attention. We now know through research that babies, when they're five months old, they know how to move their bodies based on the sound they hear in their environment. So for example, if they hear footsteps that are their moms and they already 
have, you know, learn what mom's foot, footsteps sound like. And the mom is used to bringing the baby and at five months old and carrying, getting the baby out of the, of the crib, the baby goes like this, the body, just at, at hearing that. If they hear someone else, uh, could be, you know, another parent or a grandparent who usually comes and is like, hi, and tickles. And so as soon as they hear the footsteps, the baby goes, because they know they're going to be picked, they're going to be tickled, and the body just prepares for that. The body is our first communication system, not our oral words. But what happens after the seven years of life is that when we get the download, we start not only communicating, we start learning about ourselves, we start thinking, we start having that internal language come through words. That internal communication system becomes words. And we're going to see in our next workshop what happens with those words and how do we think about ourselves that it's also a way in which we have learned to think about ourselves in, in very specific ways, how we communicate internally in our internal dialogue. But what I like to do is um, a question that I, I learned from, uh, let's see, do we have time? Yes, we do have time. A question that I've learned from uh, two of my teachers, John and Jennifer Wellwood, where Sometimes we would start these retreats, and you know, there are some people here who study with them, so maybe you remember this question, which is a very simple question, and it is, what are you experiencing right now? And if, you're, if you can all drop in for a moment into your body, and if it helps you bring your eyelids down or closing your eyelids, just notice in this moment, what are you experiencing right now in your body? And with either your eyes closed or looking down, this is not about connecting with others, this is about connecting with yourself. Are you willing to say it out loud or if people in Zoom are willing to unmute themselves and say them? say that out loud. What are you experiencing right now? Calm. Where is that calm in your body? Mostly to my torso, but kind of everywhere. Thank you. Calm mostly in the torso, everywhere also. What are you experiencing right now? A longing for connection. Mm. Where are you noticing that longing in your body? In your stomach. In your stomach. Thank you. And fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety. Where is that in your body? In my face and my hands. Thank you face and hands. Anxiety. Anxiety in your stomach. What are you experiencing right now? It's like sense of thinking through mm, thinking through. Mm-hmm. In your head. Sense of coming home to myself. Mm -hmm. Where are you experiencing that? I think it's all over, but especially in my shoulders and sense of relaxation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What are you experiencing right now? Clarity. Thank you. And now bring to mind one of those things that you wrote on the list of what's hard for you to communicate. 
whether it's expressing yourself with vulnerability or talking about yourself or expressing your feelings, describing your experience. And as you bring that to mind, notice your body. Notice the physical and energetic sensations of your body. Notice what are you experiencing right now? Or rather notice what you are experiencing right now. Hmm. Tightness in the chest. What else? What are you experiencing right now as you bring to mind what's hard to communicate? Calm. Where is the calmness? In their torso. Thank you. What are you experiencing right now? Guardedness. Guardedness. Where is the guardedness? Shoulders. Shoulders. Thank you. You can open your eyes. Thank you. I have a little piece of homework for all of you. And you're invited to come to the next workshop, which is in September 7th, maybe? 14th. Let's see. I think I had the dates here. Okay, we'll look it up. Sometime in the in next month, we have uh, another workshop. So the homework I'd love to give you is um, to start noticing the sensations in your body as you are communicating something that's easy, because you've learned to communicate that. It feels easy. And to notice what, ha- what happens in your body when you're communicating something that feels hard to communicate? And just like what we did in the initial meditation, receive, listen, and feel were the three words, and embrace were the th- four words that I was using, but listen, receive, and feel what your body is communicating to you. Because the gateway of liberation, if you want to communicate consciously, is through understanding what's happening right here, right now, in the body. Is to bring our awareness to that. Once we bring our awareness to that, the second step would be to, in with people that we feel safe with, to be able to say that out loud. That's the communication aspect of it. And sometimes is to be able to ask others, what's happening in your body right now? Instead of, what are you feeling? Because they might have more access to noticing what's here right now in the body, rather than a feeling word. So what's happening in your body right now? And just start noticing, because if you do, you are going to start to see kind of like the anatomy of your communication habits. And that's super useful when we then want to move into conscious relating. Because then what we learn, what we learn is that it's just a sensation. We're going to survive this. 
and then we can thrive. But first, before we can learn to trust that we're going to go past survival, we need to be able to listen what's going on in here. Questions, comments, objections, all welcome. I just really appreciate the um, simplicity of bringing it back to something that I can tune into mm. and that that gives me that a foundation for building on. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Yeah. Pauline. My biggest takeaway was you sharing your example of how you progressed with the difficulty, with the example of you and Matthew, mm -hmm. and being able to stay, and how you shared the different iterations of you. Yeah. And I could feel the shift. Mm. Mm, thank you. And as I said, that takes years. It takes time. So we need to give ourselves the understanding and the grace that it will take time, you know that by September, we would have not all shifted our communication, <laughs> you know? especially when these have been habits that we have been engaging in for decades. Yes, Laura. Um, I like to express gratitude, especially from everybody, as well as you, about the finding the safety inside the discomfort. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Things that make you uncomfortable without having judgment around those things. I think a lot of times when I open up to friends and family about something I'm going through, it's like a, an innate reaction. I want to fix it or like offer advice or like a solution. It's just nice to get it out there without even trying to fix it. Just exactly. Yeah. And this goes back to, you know, what we agree to cultivate the, the trust in your own authority and that you have the capacity. And that by sharing this with us, you are just sharing part of your beautiful human experience. And we can accompany you in that experience without having to fix anything, because you can do it if fixing is needed. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Michael. Mm, beautiful. And where is that hope in your body right now? In your heart. Mm, beautiful. I'd love to hear maybe from people who haven't shared yet, like if you have a question, a comment, an objection, all welcome. And you can also say pass. And it would be just lovely to hear your voice even if you say pass. Yeah, Tamara. come into like a conversation where where it's like so like removing the the layers and and um, kind of revealing of the interior landscapes of the emotions uh through communication especially after um just going through a lot and trying to like actually work more from the inside of like using my body to relax Mm -hmm. um, but not really communicating because it's too much or too complex in words. So I have, I'm at a loss with words and I've been more like just trying to work from the inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing your voice. Mm -hmm. Any others? It's kind of an acknowledgement of the dissonance between what you have learned is okay communication and where you find yourself. Because our, especially our culture is changing so fast, so yeah. fast about what's okay. Mm -hmm. I would travel for five months into some completely other culture, come back, and what I knew is no longer what is known as okay. And so the, there is a sense of disconnection. Where you're like, but that was okay. Mm -hmm. like, no, it's not anymore. Okay, right. it's not anymore. 
and then there's a sense of discomfort and catching up. And we're changing so fast and so constantly, sometimes there's never a sense that I've caught up and I'm going to have to change it again tomorrow. So, mm. and that, it's challenging. Yes, and so coming back to your body is how you're able to be with the language and the communication that is constantly shifting. As you said, because language is alive, culture is alive, and it's something that doesn't get, you know, stuck. Although in linguistics, we have this, uh, this uh, um, concept of um, linguistic fossilization which is what happens when we have learned, which is what we kind of like we were doing today, like kind of like, a, you know, you're an anthropologist, but like archaeology within ourselves, like removing those, like going inside and looking at those fossils that have been there of our communication patterns. When we have linguistic facilitation, it is because we have learned to communicate in one particular way and we keep communicating that way through the rest of our lives. You know, like people who are, uh, it's uh, perhaps like a cliche to notice like they, we have these phrases like crusty old people who are like, you know, always complaining and always in a bad mood. But it, they've learned that communicating um, bad mood, like that was accepted. That's what they learned. So they continue that and it's fossilized so much so that that's all they talk about, right? We also know um, uh, linguistic fossilization when we are immigrants or we are bilingual or trilingual and we are multilingual and we learn one language and then we go to another place where another language is spoken, we speak another language and we don't keep progressing because language and culture are changing. We don't keep progressing or come or, you know, uh, or, um, uh, upgrading, if you will, our language of that language that we knew. So then we use words. When we go back to those communities, we use words that everybody's like, nobody has used that word in like 30 years, <laughs> you know? And that's because our language has fossilized. Yeah. Okay. Anything else anybody would like to ask, say, or anybody on Zoom? Hello, I'm anybody? online. Can yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I just want to say, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you. I'm here with two other people, actually. So I didn't know how it would be awkward or but I've already learned a lot. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. So and I feel that in my in my heart and my, yeah, body and I notice I'm nervous to share. So yeah. I'm feeling that as well. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for letting us know like what's happening in your body right now. Yeah. And you and the, and the two others are most welcome uh, all the time. So you can come, you can have three of you on camera or whatever you, you need. Yes. Thank you. And what's your name? Rita. Rita. Thank Rita. you, Rita. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. To zoom in. Oh, grateful. To the... Yes, we're so grateful you were able to zoom in to all of you from different parts of the country. And all right, so um, let's close this by saying this is just the first of monthly uh, workshops that we're going to be doing where we're going to be exploring things. We're going to be in other um, workshops. Sometimes we're going to do role play. Sometimes we're going to do um, working with a group of people. And um, so bring something to write with if, if you want so that you can also write some things. And they're always very interactive. I also want to invite you all to get some resources. So I have some resources here for free for you. Um, one of them is that I have a podcast that is going into its fourth year. So we have like 150, yes, 150 episodes that are out there. All the podcasts are 15 minute communication, conscious communication workshops. So they're about that bite size so that you can learn something. And, and there are uh, three of them that I'd like for you, if you're interested to check out. The podcast is called the Language Alchemy Podcast. You can find it in any platform, completely free. And um, 
One is uh, episode number six, why communication is the foundation of everything you want in life. It's episode number six. Um, the other is episode um, 113, a simple practice to stay connected to your internal communication system. And uh, that has to do with the body. 113, 113, yes. And then the last one is uh, 132. And that is, you probably aren't the communicator you think you are. <laughs> yes, myself included. Most of us are not. You're going to hear some stories there. Um, yes. And also something else. I, I work with individuals. I work with couples. I work with change agents. And if you're interested in working with me, I have a group coaching starting next week that you can check out. There, um, we put there um, some QR codes that you can check out, but it's languagealchemy.com forward slash group coaching. And, um, and then there's a, a podcast party to celebrate that the podcast has made it to its third year, completely free. It's on August 23rd, this Friday at 2 p.m. And I'm going to be raffling their sessions with me, uh, seats in the group coaching program and seats in online programs that I have. So you're all welcome to come and, and celebrate. Party? The party is online. Okay. So yeah, it's an hour long. So all, all you need is to sign up, then you'll get the Zoom link and um, 2 p.m. on Friday. Yeah. The group, the group coaching is also online. Yes, thank you. Yes, all right. Well, thank you so much. Let's just... Um, close this for a moment having a sense of appreciation for the space that we have co-created together here within a space that was intentionally co-created and is being co-created for liberation compassion love inclusion diversity and for all the circumstances that allowed us to be here today, exploring conscious relating together, for all the beings, the visible and the invisible beings that are supporting us. And let's just extend a wish that every single being in our precious human family may learn that they can communicate authentically and bring forth more love, more peace, and show up in the world as mature, generous, conscious human beings. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Hope to see you in September or this Friday or listen to the podcast.